All right. Apologies to the people still waiting online for assignment uh, three. I'm going to start talking mainly because uh, we have a lot to cover today. Um, OK, so today's lecture is going to be a little bit different. Um, mostly in that we're going to be, because we're covering stuff that we already covered, uh, I'm going to be kind of relying on you to ask me questions. Um, I'll be asking you questions to make sure that you're still awake. But uh, the entire purpose of this class is to make sure that you guys understand what I'm talking about. So if you don't understand what I'm talking about, please speak up, because this is kind of the last chance you have to really interrogate me. Um, OK, so what are we going to be talking about today? We're going to be talking about the entire term so far, uh, from the entity relationship model through SQL, through relational algebra, and evaluating relational algebra, uh, through things like uh, rewriting relational algebra into new forms, uh, index selection, index design, and cost estimation. A lot of stuff to cover today. Um, I may go a little bit over. For that, I apologize. Um, I will not be offended if you start uh, filtering out and rely on the video for, uh, for the rest of the lecture. So. Uh, let's get to it. The first thing that we covered in this class is the entity relationship model. Uh, the ER model starts with a basic concept, namely an entity. An entity can be anything, a thing that has some attributes. James Kirk, for example, has an identifier, a unique identifier. He has a name, he has a rank, he has an associated ship, he has a lot of properties. And the ER model basically says, okay, let's model this entity model James T. Kirk with uh, some sort of entity, and that entity has a set of attributes. We can take multiple entities that fall into similar categories, and we can group them into sets, called entity sets. An entity set has uh, a group, a collect, is a collection of similar entities, entities with a similar set of attributes. Um, every attribute uh, in particular, every attribute has uh, a set of allowable values called its domain, and uh, the entities in a set have the same set of attributes. Any questions so far? Good. The, every entity ha also has, uh, may or may not have, a key attribute, or one or more attributes that act as a key. A key is simply a one or more attributes that uniquely identify the entity. Uh, for example, for officers, uh, we might have a unique identifier. For, uh, for people in America, we may have something like a, a social security number. Uh, for uh, UB students, your UBIT is a unique identifier. And uh, you can also have multiple identifiers for, a, uh, for an entity. For example, a course has both uh, a course code, as well as a semester that the course is being offered. Now, entities can be connected by what are called relationships. Uh, a relationship is, an, is a connection between two or more entities. Uh, we can, like with, uh, like with entities, we can group relationships into relationship sets. And also like entities, a relationship can have attributes. Uh, as well as keys. Um, key constraints. So when we're talking about entities and relationships, there can be various properties that describe uh, what kind of characteristics those uh, entities, sorry, there can be various constraints on the domains of the attributes uh, of the various entities. Uh, one of these is a key constraint. And a key constraint basically says that two, uh, two entities in a given entity set do not share the same uh, values for uh, the attributes that are keys. Uh, there are other ways of using keys as constraints. So for example, we can have references. Uh, we can have a relationship between two different uh, entities that are identified by specific uh, keys. So for example, we can have uh, a relationship 
where every single entity in, on one side of the relationship maps to exactly one entity on the other side of the relationship. We call this a one-to-one -one key constraint. Uh, similarly, we can have one entity on the left-hand side mapping to any number of entities on the right-hand side. We can denote these by using arrows. There's also what's called a participation constraint. So a arrow indicates that there is at, at most, sorry, that uh, there is a, uh, that the, the source of the arrow can occur uh, as many times as we like. A participation constraint uh, denoted as a bold line indicates that the entity must participate in a given uh, constraint. So, for example, a ship must have a commanding officer. There is at least one instance of that relationship for every single entity. Okay, that was the whirlwind tour through entity, the entity relationship model. Are there any questions on the entity relationship model? Yes. But not what? Uh, the entity relationship model do includes uh, or captures, I should say, uh, key constraints, and it contains. Uh, sorry, what was the other one you said? Uh, it captures key constraints with an underline. It carry, uh, captures foreign key constraints with an arrow. Uh, it does not capture uh, domain constraints, although those are typically implicit based on the type of the attribute. Uh, it does not, however, note what that uh, those domain constraints are. Does that address your concern? Okay. Any other questions on the entity relationship model? Yes? So the, does, it, does it mean that the relationship are always defined by foreign keys in between the attributes? If there's a relationship between uh, two tables, then it's always defined by foreign keys? Not necessarily. Uh, that is the most common case. But uh, you could also have a relationship, for example, uh, occurs before. Uh, event one occurs before uh, event two, and that's defined, uh, that can be defined procedurally. Uh, and more precisely, it, uh, there's, there's not a foreign key relationship there. Um, but yes, most frequently, the, the most common uh, occurrence of this is as a foreign key relationship. Yeah. So if you want to recite in a quick query, uh, would you say that every officer has a relationship? There are other columns in the same table which has subordinate as well as commander column? So in terms of SQL, this would be described, or in terms of uh, create table statements, uh, this would probably be described as uh, one, co one additional column in the officer relation with uh, a foreign key relationship back to itself. Uh, the, uh, the, create, um, the subordinate column would have a, uh, a reference to its own officer identifier. Uh, typically, you wouldn't include a reference from the commander back to the subordinate, uh, back to all of the subordinates. Any idea why? Why, why wouldn't we encode uh, all of the subordinates of a given commander? So a commander could have many subordinates, and as a consequence, uh, the size of that column would grow uh, would be grow unboundedly. Okay. Um, all right. Any other questions on entity relationship? Yes. So uh, you represent those by using I'm sorry, these are uh, 
there is a typo on the slide. Uh, this should be uh, key constraints identify entities that participate uh, in um, that must, uh, sorry. Ah, yeah. So you denote many to many. Uh, you start with the basic case, which is uh, many to many relationship. And to denote a many to one relationship, you use an arrow on the side of uh, the one. I'm getting that right. Uh, officers? Yes. So every officer has uh, at most one ship. So this, this is the side of, sorry, this is the side of the many, and this is the side of the one. Um, and you do a one-to-one -one by having two arrows. So this means that this participates at most once. This means that this participates at most once. And if the line is bold, that means that it must. Uh, this can be exactly one, and this can be zero or one. Uh, if this sorry, if this line is bold and has an arrow, that means that this must participate at least once, and the arrow means it can only participate at most once. So it has to participate exactly once in this relationship. Yes. So the, the question is, uh, how do you deal with uh, ternary constraints? Um, a ternary constraint, uh, ternary constraints occur very infrequently. Um, there are some use cases. In general, my, uh, in general, I would say ternary constraints are not a significant concern. Uh, when are they useful versus what do they mean? Uh, they mean that three entities participate in a given relationship. When are they useful? Very infrequently. Um, any other questions on entity relationship? All right, moving on to SQL. So the basic structure of a SQL query, select, optional distinct parameter, set of targets, a, a list of relations and a where uh, clause. And naively, without any sort of uh, additional um, manipulation, naively, the way that you evaluate this is by first computing the Cartesian product of every relation that appears in relation list, discard all of the attributes that uh, are not in the target, uh, sorry, uh, discard all of the tuples that fail the condition, and then delete any attributes that are not in the target list. Um, if the unique or distinct fields are, um, are specified, you uh, either eliminate rows that occur with duplicates, or you eliminate simply duplicate rows. Uh, question to see if you're awake. Uh, why do we need to explicitly state that uh, we want duplicate rows eliminated with the distinct operator? Yes. Speak up. Right, because SQL typically operates over bags and uh, distinct switches you over to set semantics. Why does SQL operate over bags? Yes. So you can express sets using bags, but you can't express bags using sets, at least not easily. Uh, what is the other, uh, is there any uh, performance implication? Duplicate elimination is expensive, so we want to avoid it if at all possible. Great. All right. Um, 
As, as with the entity relationship model, there are a number of types of constraints that you can specify in SQL. You can specify domain constraints, which limit the valid values that a uh, particular attribute can take. You can specify key constraints, uh, primary key and unique, which indicate that a one or more fields must have a unique value in the given relation. Uh, you can specify foreign key constraints, which indicate that a particular attribute references a key uh, attribute in a different relation. Um, these can also encode uh, participation constraints by using things like uh, drop, uh, by using the uh, cascade uh, feature, which forcibly re uh, removes entries from, uh, which forcibly removes entries as they've been deleted. Uh, sorry, forcibly remove uh, cascades, deletions, and updates uh, down to dependent, uh, dependent rows of the, or dependent uh, relations. And you can also have table constraints, which are sort of a catch-all uh, for any kind of uh, constraint that you uh, can imagine. There's not really much, yes? Ah, yeah, so uh, a foreign key, you can, you can include a, uh, in a SQL, uh, sorry, in, in the definition of a foreign key constraint, you can include uh, what to do if the dependent uh, attribute changes. So the, uh, when you first insert a tuple into uh, a relation with a foreign key constraint, the foreign key constraint will be verified to see if there, you will not be allowed to insert a tuple if there is a, uh, if the foreign key constraint is not pointing to anything useful. Uh, after that happens, however, uh, the database doesn't really know what to do if the dependent uh, value is removed. So you can do one of three different things. You can either uh, react to the uh, deletion or update of a key attribute by uh, deleting or updating the foreign key attributes that point to it. Um, you can react by uh, replacing the foreign key attributes with a null value or you can react by simply precluding that kind of transaction, uh, the, a transaction that would delete a, a key attribute that is referenced from the outside. Does that address your concern? So, uh, So when you define your foreign key constraint, uh, in this case, I'm saying that uh, attribute foo, foo references uh, foo table. Um, I can add a cascade parameter, or sorry, I can add a tree um, on I can add one of two different uh, fields here. One to do uh, something when I get an update, one to do something when I, uh, when a row from foo table is deleted or updated. Uh, and what I can do here is either cascade, in which case when I change foo table uh, dot foo, that will get updated as well. Or I can delete in which case, uh, sorry, if, if I'm deleting, a cascade will cause all of the corresponding rows of this table to be deleted. Um, I can also replace with null, I can replace with a default value, 
and I can react in uh, one of several different ways. Does that address your concern better? Any other questions on SQL? All right, moving on, uh, relational algebra. Relational algebra uh, consists of five basic operations, five basic indivisible operations, selection, projection, multiplication, subtraction, and union. Um, we also have a couple of additional operations, intersection, join, division, and renaming, which can be expressed in terms of the five basic operations. An SQL statement can be converted into an equivalent relational algebra expression by using this handy dandy conversion chart. Uh, a, you start out by uh, with the source or the, the from clause uh, that turns into a set of Cartesian products. Uh, over that you apply the where clause. Over that, you apply any sort of aggregate operations. Over that, you apply the having clause. And over that, you apply the projection, the, you project out uh, the target values, and then you can do whatever ordering and uh, distinct uh, operations that you need, uh, which uh, relational algebra can't normally capture. Why? It operates on sets and not bags. Uh, technically, sets and not lists, but yes. All right, um, projection. What is the working set size of a projection operator? One tuple, great. Um, what is the working set size of a selection operator? One tuple. How about a union? One tuple, great. Wow, one tuple. Oh, SQL is easy. Um, how about a nested loop join? Yes. Uh, where are we? Union. Um, how many tuples do you need to be looking at at any given time when evaluating union? Ah, okay. Um, I should make a distinction here. Uh, I should make a distinction here. That, that's a good question. Uh, bag, uh, what is the working set size of bag union? Hmm? One tuple. What is the working set size of set union? Potentially all of the tuple. You can do it a little bit more efficiently, but yes. So uh, if I understand you correctly, uh, you need, uh, you're need. you asking why do you, you're say, uh, suggesting that you need to see all of the tuples that you've encountered before. Uh, is that because of you want to deduplicate? Right. So if you're, uh, if you're working with sets, then I, I agree. You need to see all of the tuples that you've encountered before. If you're working with bags, you don't need to do deduplication. De so once you've emitted a tuple uh, further up the chain, you don't uh, you don't need to see that tuple ever again. Does that address your concern? Uh, yeah. I will be very explicit. Um, so typically, when talking about relational algebra. Um, I'm going to be uh, talking about set relational algebra, but um, where it is relevant, I will, I, um, given that I'm talking about evaluation here, uh, uh, since typically we work with SQL, SQL is bags, uh, given that I'm talking about evaluation here, uh, bag, you're, you're right, I should have been more, uh, more precise. On the exam, this is very, uh, anywhere there is relational algebra is very clearly stated already. 
uh, whether it is bag relational algebra or set relational algebra. Does that address your concern? Any other questions? All righty. Um, what's the working set size of a relation scan or file scan operator? One tuple, great. Uh, what about a nested loop join? Hmm? How many tuples do I need to look at at any given point in time for a nested loop join? Two tuples. Uh, yeah. So I need the tuple from the left-hand side and the tuple from the right-hand side. And I can combine them. Technically, I don't need more space for that. All right. Um, right. Um, what about a non-group by aggregate? What's my working set size? One tuple. Great. Uh, what is the contents of that tuple? Actually, I should. Uh, there, there is a but here. What is the what is the but? So, can I do this for some aggregates? Yes. And what's the tuple? The current sum. Uh, can I do this for average? No. Um, you need. Okay, so you need an extra field to store what? The count and the uh, and the sum. So you can you can still store it in conceive, uh, conceptually one tuple. You just need a slightly bigger tuple. Uh, what about um, what about the uh, median value? Yeah. So for a median, you need the entire relation. All right. What about a group by aggregate? What's the working set size? The number of the number of groups. Good. Um, is there any way to reduce the uh, the size of this? Sort it. Great. So if I were to sort it, how would I take advantage of that? Or what what would I sort on first off? The group by attribute. And then what would I need to do? So I scan, and as I'm scanning, OK, so when the uh, group changes, when I move to a new group, I can emit the, tu the last tuple. Great. All right. Um, perfect. Perfect. I can skip that. Um, 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 um. All right. Let me actually. All right. Um, what other kind of join algorithms are we looking at? Uh, what other kind of join algorithms have we encountered? Nested, uh, we did nested loop. Block nested loop. What's the working set size of a block nested loop join? The block size times two. Um, one block on each side. Uh, what other joins? A hybrid hash join or a grace hash join. Uh, what is the uh, working set size of that? So how does the uh, how does the hi the hybrid hash join work? What you've been referring to as a hash join, I yeah, uh, someone okay. So for an equi join, uh, you build a ha you do a hash join on uh, when you have an equality predicate that you're joining on. How do you uh, what do you do? You generate buckets for for one of the two tables. Uh, you read in the entire table. You generate a set of uh, a hash, excuse me. You generate a hash table for it, and then 
Then you use the hash function on the other side of the relation, and for every tuple in there, you uh, check, you do a nested loop join on the uh, appropriate bucket. What is the uh, working set size then? The size of the hash table, good. Plus one tuple. All right, what other kind of, what about a sort merge join? Let's uh, break that down into two phases. What is the working set size of the merge phase? Two tuples, good. Uh, excuse me, Always is that always the case? Yes. So if we uh, under, uh, could you describe a case where uh, merge join would have a working set size larger than two tuples? So assuming that you're sorry, uh, assuming that the data was already sorted um, in the correct order. What, uh, is, is there a situation where merge sort would require more than one, uh, uh, is there a situation where merge sort would require a working set size that's more than two tuples? Yes. Duplicates. Uh, okay, so if there were multiple, uh, if there were multiple instances of the join attribute, if it wasn't a key, on one side at least, the working set size would have to be, or sorry, if it, was a, if it wasn't a key on both sides of the relation, then the working set size would have to be the number of duplicates, uh, the maximum number of duplicates uh, that occur on either side. Okay, um, what about the uh, sort? Phase. What is the working set size of a sort? Okay, so you can either do it over the entire uh, set of all uh, tuples that were read in, or so this is a case where you have a cost benefit trade off. Uh, in other words, What's my favorite answer? Um, so the uh, there are two different uh, possibilities here. Either you can load the entire thing into memory and sort it, or you can load small chunks, sort them, and use something like two-phase sort to merge them back together. Um, in the latter case, the working set size is whatever you want it to be. And in the former case, the working set size is the whole thing. Um, in the latter case, the amount of work that you do is dependent on, or the, sorry, the amount of uh, uh, IOs that you need to perform are dependent on the size of the uh, relation. Oh, sorry, the, uh, the number of IOs that you need to perform are dependent on which sort algorithm that, that you use. All right. Um, any questions on relational algebra and evaluating queries? Yes. Sorry. Okay. Okay, let's uh, let's go over this. So, uh, how do we? How does the two phase, the two pass external sort work? Okay, so you uh, first sort a whole bunch of individual pages, and then one. So that's phase one. Phase two is merging them together. And uh, how do you do that, let's say, if you're uh, doing a two-way merge? Okay, 
So you read two pages in, and then you start merging, merging them into a, a two-page long sorted book. OK, uh, using standard merge. Um, OK, uh, what happens after that? OK, so I've created, I start out with individual pages, and I make sure that each of these pages is properly sorted, and then I take those two pages, merge them into a two-page long uh, sorted buffer. Now as I'm merging these, into a fully sorted buffer, uh, what is the working set size of that? So remember, this is going to be about two pages long, but it's two pages of sorted data. Do I need to, when, which of these do I need to load in to memory initially? Let's call them. A and C. OK. And then when I exhaust one of these, uh, let's say I exhaust C, all the, the tuples in C first, I just need to load in D, right? So how many tuple, how many pages do I need in memory at any given time, at a minimum? Two. Great. Right. Can you amend that slightly? Three, because you also need one page uh, to store your output. OK, does that address your concern? Any other questions? All right. So next thing on the agenda, uh, relational algebra rewrites. Uh, we started off with uh, some very basic uh, rewrite operators. Um, Selection is decomposable, so you can take uh, a conjunction of atoms, uh, sorry, a conjunction of clauses in your selection predicate, and you can break that up into multiple individual selection predicates. Um, or equivalently, you can merge them back together. Selection is also commutative, so if I do one selection first, I can do a second selection after it. Um, projection is uh, item potent, so if I project something away, uh, then it's, it's gone, uh, which means if I have two different projections or a whole stack of projections, the only one that matters is the last one. Uh, here, uh, just to be clear, the dot, dot, dot reply, uh, means only, uh, I have a set of, pro of n projection operators nested within one, uh, nested within one another. Uh, we also have a couple of rules for join and by association, uh, sorry, for cross product and by association for join, uh, namely that joins are associative, so I can parenthesize them however I like and still get the same result, uh, and they're commutative, so I can uh, reorder them however I like and still get the same result. Questions? Projection and selection commute, except All right, can anyone read? <laughs> yes. OK. Uh, the Ah, uh, wow. Except Right, so you can't project away a attribute that um, you cannot project away an attribute that is referenced by the selection predicate. So the columns that you project down to must include all of the columns that you're uh, you're using in your selection predicate. All right, um, we also have a fairly standard uh, uh, operation. A join is just a selection on top of a cross product, so we can always alternate between these two representations freely. 
And that's an important one. Um, and of course, the only reason that you'd actually want to combine them together is if we have a good join algorithm for uh, the clause in C. Um, if C only applies to one of the two relations, we can, yes? So there is always a C, um, but if, uh, in terms of notation, conceptually, there is always a C. Uh, in terms of notation, uh, if there is no subscript on the join, uh, that is often referred to as a natural join, and it means take all of, that there is an equality predicate on all of the attributes with the same name on either side of the relation. So if I have a relation R, A, B, and another relation S, B, C, and then I have a expression R join S with no subscript, then unless there is reason to think otherwise, the implicit subscript here is R dot B equals S dot B. If I had another attribute here, C, then it would be R dot B equals S dot B and R dot C equals S dot C because C occurs in both relations. Does that address your concern? Yes. Then it would be a cross product. Uh, the question was if there was no common attributes, then you could essentially treat this as a cross product. Any other questions? All right. Um, so if the condition that appears in the selection predicate uh, does not reference uh, attributes from one of the two relations, you can always push it down into the Cartesian cross product and get a better result. Uh, sorry, get a um, uh, potentially more efficient uh, operation because you're projecting on uh, well, joins are expensive. The bigger the joins, the more expensive they are. Uh, you can do something similar with projection. So if you have a projection down to a set of attributes, you can split the attributes apart and push them into a Cartesian cross product. Um, this is not necessarily the case for joins. Uh, a couple of other properties, unions and int Sorry, unions and intersections are commutative and associative. Uh, so you can uh, reparenthesize unions. You can reparenthesize uh, intersections. You can uh, move, uh, reorder the uh, the order in which they appear as well. Um, and selection and projection can be pushed down into unions or uh, back up. Uh, sorry, uh, down into unions or back up out of unions. Um, right. Well, we are running low on time. All right. Um, basic question. I have two different join expressions. Which is better? Yes. Thank you. All right. Um, OK. All right, moving on. Indexes. So we've got two different general classes of index. Uh, one class of index actually stores the data in the leaves of the index. Um, this is referred to as a clustered index. We've got a second type of index where all that is stored is a set of pointers to where the data is actually residing. This is referred to as an unclustered index. Um, a cluster. Uh, when building an index, we need to consider two different things. What do we need to consider? So, or sorry, when uh, not building index, when deciding how to store data, we need to consider two general things. So, uh, we'll need to look at um, the schema. Okay, what about the schema? 
Okay, so what index, uh, what index or indexes we should build? And how about the data? So how do, how do we store the data? So we could, we could store the data in uh, some sort of sorted order. We could store it unsorted. What do we call that? Did I hear heap? Heap. Uh, we can uh, store it as a heap, or we could store it actually in the index itself. Um, the, so we basically need to consider two different things, uh, how the data is organized and then how the data is actually physically laid out on disk. Um, now, what are, what kind, oh, wow, we are going pretty crazy. Um, let me get back to that question in two slides. Okay. So, um, an index is basically there for one purpose and one purpose alone, to simplify uh, this general kind of uh, query structure. If I have a selection predicate that's sitting over a file scan operator, I can streamline the evaluation of that file scan operator by using an index or by making use of the way that the data is laid out. Um, if I have two different, uh, two different subclauses in that selection predicate, recall, we can reorder these things. We can take a selection predicate and decompose it into multiple selection predicates. So we can pick out the clause that is most useful to us and we can uh, have the, uh, once again get back to our sort of selection operator sitting on top of a file scan operator. Um, and we can take advantage of an index that specifically indexes the attributes that appear in condition clause uh, C1. Uh, under certain circumstances, when the attribute being, being indexed uh, appears in multiple clauses, we might be able to make use of that as well. So we can take, uh, for example, a, a query where we have uh, bounds on attribute A, and we can turn that into a scan uh, over uh, a, a specific portion of an index. And finally, we can do, uh, we can take advantage of a join sitting on top of a, uh, of a file scan operator by turning it into a index nested loop join. So rather than scanning the entire relation S, rather than trying to visit every single tuple in the relation S, we iterate. For every tuple in relation R, we do an index lookup for the matching tuples in relation S. Uh, by the way, what's the working set size here? How many tuples do we need to see from R? One. How many tuples do we need to see from S? One. Uh, well, it, it, it depends. Um, and what else does it depend on? The index, yes. So depending on which index we're using, uh, the lookup cost may be slightly different. Uh, let's say, yeah. So we've talked about a couple of different styles of index. We've talked about uh, ind index structured access method uh, tree indexes, which work very simply. We have a set of keys separating pointers. The pointers point down into the tree. Um, to dereference a value in an ISAM data structure, uh, in an ISAM index, uh, we find the two keys that bound the value that we're looking for, and we follow the pointer. And we repeat this process until we get to the leaves, uh, the leaf pages. So if I have a, a value between K3 and K4, I would follow pointer P3. And I would repeat this process until I get to a leaf page, at which point I have just one page of data that I can scan through however I like. Now, uh, the disadvantage to an ISAM data structure is that it is not easily modifiable. So people came up with a, uh, a new technique uh, ages ago called a B plus tree, which is more or less the same basic principle, but rather than trying to fill up all of the index nodes, we keep a couple of them free. And this allows us to resize the B plus tree uh, more efficiently. 
Any questions so far, by the way? All right. What is the cost of doing, uh, skipping over a thing, uh, on this basic kind of index structure where we have every single non-leaf page completely full? What is the cost of doing a lookup? Assuming that we have, uh, let's say, k keys per page. Log base k of the size of the relation. Good. Uh, what is the cost of doing an insertion? This is a bit of a trick question because, in general, this data structure isn't really designed to be modified. Uh, the, the hack uh, that people ha originally used is that you simply add leaf, pa uh, sorry, add overflow pages, in which case the cost really depends on how many modifications have occurred previously. What about a B plus tree? What is the average lookup cost? Log base, you can call it log base k. It's log base of, well, a little less than k. Um, if the fill factor, uh, sorry, if typically the width of a tree is going to be somewhere between k over 2 and k. So 3k three, three over 4 uh, is reasonable. Um, right. What's the cost of doing an insertion into a B plus tree? What's the common case? So how many reads do we need to perform? Or what, what is the process that takes us to an insertion in a B plus tree? Can you speak up? OK, so first you have to find the page where the data is going to be stored. What's next? OK, so first I have to do, I have to find the page. How many IOs is that? Log base k of n. Um, then I need to read that data page, and I need to write it back. How many? Uh, so two more IOs. What happens if I can't do an insertion? Uh, what happens if the data page is full? I have to split it. What does that entail? So what do I have to modify when I do a split? I have to add a key to the parent page. Good. So. That's going to add what? Two more? Technically, two more IOs. You can actually save on one of those because you've already kind of descended through the tree to reach the parent. You've already read the parent in at, at some point. Assuming your working set size can contain at least log base k of n uh, data values, then which is usually a safe assumption, then uh, you can save yourself one IO there. All right, good. Um, all right, so we talked about tree indexes as one form of indexing. We also talked about hash-based indexes. So a hash-based index involves first using a so-called hash function to assign data values, uh, to assign records or tuples to individual buckets. Um, the default uh, al the default index structure here is that you have, uh, for each bucket, uh, one dedicated page. And if the page gets full, you start writing to overflow pages. Uh, what is my lookup cost in this case, in the best case? One. Perfect. So I need to only read the one page. I have a reference precisely to the page that I'm looking for. Uh, what if I'm doing a scan? Let's say I'm looking for all tuples where A is less than 100. What's the lookup cost then? I heard 
Something that sounded like the right answer from around here. Oh, then, yeah. So I need to read the entire, uh, the entire index in, including all overflow pages. Uh, what's the cost for doing an insert? An insert, in the best case, one. Great. Uh, and what is the downside to a static hash? It overflows, and if I, so I have to pick n very carefully. If I pick an n that is too small, I end up with too much data. Uh, sorry, too, too many overflow pages. If I pick an n that is too big, I end up with unnecessary bucket pages. Great. So we, we talked about a handful of different algorithms to address this. Uh, possibility one, rather than actually storing all of the data in these buckets, uh, we'd like to be able to resize the index efficiently. Um, if we, uh, the downside though is that every time we resize the uh, the index, we need to re uh, partition all of the the data. We need to take all of the data pages and uh, <clears throat> all of the data pages, and we need to split them apart. And that can be very expensive. So rather than splitting the data pages, what we can do is instead split the index pages. So by using an index, indirecting uh, storing pointers to where the data is, is actually located, uh, we can save ourselves uh, the cost of copying the entire uh, contents of the index by only copying uh, pointers to those data pages. And then whenever we need to split, we only need to split individual uh, one data page at a time. We also talked about linear hashing. This one's used quite a bit less frequently, but the idea is essentially that you take your entire hash index and you partition it progressively. Um, you start with, uh, you pick a particular point uh, in the index, you refer to it as the ne using uh, the next identifier, and then everything uh, before the next pointer has been split, everything after the next pointer has not yet been split. So in this example, I've split uh, data values that fall into the first two buckets. When I reach the end of the, uh, the index, when I've split all of the buckets, then I start again from the very top. We talked about a, uh, we also talked about in class uh, a method that you guys designed uh, called, uh, well, I believe we were referring to it as hierarchical hashing. Um, this method essentially involved building a tree over all of your uh, data pages. So every time you uh, fill up a data page, you split it using a new hash function. Now, for this example, uh, for this kind of data structure that you guys came up with, uh, what would the lookup cost be for a value? Number of number of hash functions. Uh, in other words, the, the depth of the tree or log base, the width, uh, the size of the hash function. So log base k, where k is the width of the hash function. Uh, what's the cost for doing an insertion? So what, what, uh, how would you go about doing an insertion? Okay, so you first have to do a lookup for the data page where the uh, value is going to be, then you read that data page in, you write it back, and there's a potential that you might need to split it. Okay. All right. Um, let's do a little bit of analysis as well. So we've talked about a variety of different indexing structures. Um, I'd also like you to have a sense of what is relevant in a query. So I've got one of the TPCH queries up here. Um, what features might be interesting when designing an index structure. Yes. Hmm? The re um, well, even before we get there, what is uh, just how do you, uh, what is the reduction factor based on? Okay. 
So how, how the data is arranged, okay. Well, actually, let, let, me, um, let me back up a little bit. The reduction factor is useful for computing what? The... So what is... Um, the reduction factor would be useful when, um, when doing what kind of computation? Okay, so if, uh, it would be useful for computing something about a selection operator, and what specifically about a selection operator? The, okay, so it would be useful, okay, so, so the selection operator is connected to the, the, uh, the where clause. Uh, let me put this another way. There's a couple of different things uh, as you're looking at a query, there's a couple of different properties of the query that you might be interested in. So for example, I might be interested in uh, what kind of uh, index to use. Um, field. Okay, that, that could be used, uh, so whether the field is unique or not could be used to compute, a re to estimate the reduction factor. Um, so I, what I'm trying to get at here is that the reduction fa factor is useful when computing the cost of the query, when computing the uh, cost of a particular plan. Um, what I'd like to do a little bit, uh, go over a little bit, because we didn't do this, well, we did this a little bit. Uh, what I would like to go over right now is uh, what kind of factors go into the selection of an index. So I've, if I've got, uh, uh, if, if I have a query here, what would I be looking at when deciding to uh, what kind of index to build uh, to support this specific class of query? The, what do you mean by operators? Okay, so I would be looking at the where clause. I'd be looking at what kind of things are, what kind of attributes are being uh, compared. In this case, um, I might be interested in uh, ship date because ship date has a pair of very nice tight bounds. Um, I might be interested in discount because discount uh, has, again, a set of, uh, a set of tight bounds. Um, what about this, this query? So this one's a little more, more complex. We've got a where clause, but we've also got another, a couple of other features where, uh, where having uh, the correct index or the correct storage layout might actually uh, benefit us. What kind of, uh, what else might be useful here? Order by, I heard. Uh, why would you say that? Okay, so if the data is already sorted, then you can take advantage of that uh, and avoid having to sort it again. Um, any other clauses that might be relevant? So we talked about a couple of other cases where order by or sorting might be potentially useful. Joins, okay, so the join, if I'm doing a natural join, maybe having uh, my data sorted by uh, key might be useful. Uh, what else? There's one other uh, operator. Group by. Yes. So uh, if I have a group by clause, that's another potential reason to have data sorted in a particular order. Okay. Any questions so far? Any questions about indexes in general? Anything that I haven't covered? Yes.
be waiting way for this Yep. So again, the answer depends. Um, the default, the general, in the general case, indexes are built on demand. Uh, part of the uh, definition of a table includes one or more uh, indexes. So if I have a primary key, that'll define this, uh, the storage layout of, uh, of my data. And often, there will also be an implicit index, a B tree or something uh, along those lines, built on top of, of that. But you can also specify additional indexes to be built um, on top of the data. So in a typical database, that's what we'll, uh, the indexes get built and maintained when they are created. Uh, when some user comes along and says, I would like an index on X. Exactly. Exactly. So the, the database administrator comes along, thinks through it, tries to analyze what kind of uh, queries are going to be uh, hitting the schema, and then decides based on the kind of things that we've been discussing, which kind of uh, indexes and uh, would be the most appropriate. Now, there's the, the it depends part. There's been a lot of work on sort of on-demand indexes. There's been a lot of work on figuring out which indexes are the most appropriate. And that's an incredibly difficult problem, one that has been generating research papers two, three decades already. Um, given a particular workload, which, which are the most useful indexes? Uh, and there's more recently been some work on uh, actually building these indexes incrementally. So as I ask a question, that query involves doing some work. And if my data is initially let's say, unsorted, then I have to, at the very least, partition it into two classes. One class that is greater than the value that I'm looking for, and one class that is less than the value that I'm looking for. Um, let's say I'm looking for, find me all tuples that are greater than some, some constant. So now that I've partitioned the data, I can actually make use of that. Uh, I can store, change the, the physical layout of the data, and this is, uh, you can then take advantage of that when doing subsequent queries. But, but that's uh, not the common case. Any other questions? All right, uh, last thing that I want to cover is uh, cost estimation. So we talked about, um, we, well, we kind of already uh, jumped onto this a little bit. Uh, what kind of things do we consider when uh, building, when deciding the cost of a particular operator? So one thing was the reduction factor. Um, now, how do we estimate the reduction factor of a given selection predicate? What kind of assumptions can we make? Or what kind of statistics might we want to gather? The distribution of values. OK, so we might want to get, uh, compute uh, a distribution of the values. Um, how might we represent that? Or what information might, might we gather to, to get that? OK, so at the more complex end of the uh, spectrum, we could build an actual histogram over the data and use that histogram to estimate the, uh, to estimate, uh, the distribution of, of values for a given attribute. We can use that uh, to estimate a reduction factor. Uh, could we do something simpler? Uh, okay, so we could assume that the uh, entire data is uniformly distributed. So we have a range of values. What kind of statistics would we need uh, to uh, get a uniform distribution? Or to take advantage of a uh, of knowing that the data is, or assuming that the data is uniformly distributed. OK, so the number of distinct values that uh, could appear. 
And if we know the number of total values and the number of distinct values, we can get approximately, purely as an estimate, how many uh, occurrences there are of a single value. And then we can use that uh, to compute how many, uh, how many uh, tuples would be selected by a given uh, selection predicate. All right. Um, so we actually talked about the join algorithms already. We talked about the working set sizes. We talked about the I.O. costs. Uh, we built up this big chart. I'm including this uh, handy dandy table um, for, uh, I'm including this handy dandy table and uh, that we built up on, we essentially built this table up last class. Uh, same thing with this one. Um, that said, are there, uh, any final questions that anyone has for uh, concerns, unsureties? All right, well, um, with that, good. Uh, be back here. Uh, make sure to show up on time. Uh, there is a lot of logistical stuff that has to happen at the beginning of the exam, and I want to give everyone the maximum amount, amount of time uh, possible. So please be here on time and see everyone uh, on uh, Wednesday.